you for having me here tonight. Um, and I want to thank you for all you do. I think uh, teaching is one of the uh, most important professions in our society. And I know sometimes you all don't get the um, thanks that you deserve. And uh, my daughter's a teacher, third grade. So, um, and I've actually done, in my, throughout my career, I've actually done a lot of teaching of adult courses for bridge inspection and bridge design. And we'll see bridge engineering is kind of my specialty. But uh, again, thank you, and thank you for taking your time out of uh, your, your busy week. Um, as Natasha said, my name is Eric Martz um, with KCI Technologies. We are an engineering consulting firm. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself shortly, but does anybody recognize this bridge? North and South Carolina, close, but not quite. Is that West Virginia? It's West Virginia, yes. The New River Gorge New Bridge. New River Gorge Bridge, that's correct. So, actually, my, the, my former employer designed that bridge in the early 70s in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, from the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania office. Um, at the time, it was the world's longest steel arch bridge, and it stands at the top of the uh, deck, here in mid-span, it stands 876 feet off the gorge floor. And uh, back in the late 90s, uh, GMC had a commercial uh, when they for their Blazer, the, 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 the mini, the mid-size SUV, where they actually dropped the Blazer off this bridge with with a bungee. I don't know if anybody remembers that commercial or not. But um, every October they have Bridge Day. Uh, and they closed the bridge down to vehicular traffic and people can bungee jump and so forth. But, and actually, the company I used to work for, not only, not only did they design the bridge, but they also used to inspect the bridge every year. And you know, with the geometry of an arch, you can see it gets pretty steep here um, as you get closer to the uh, riverbanks. And a colleague of mine well, inspected this bridge many, many times. And I, he was telling me, um, I said, well, how do you get, you know, how do you inspect the bridge from an access point? Because the inspection crane that sits on top of this, uh, would sit on top of the deck does not have the reach to go all the way down here. And he said, they walk on top of the steel arch ribs. But where it got very steep, they would have to get on their butt and slide from one column to the other column like it was a sliding board because it was too steep to walk. So, you know, that just goes to show you that, uh, you know, <laughs> we have to inspect our bridges uh, by, by federal law every two years minimum, so uh, there's people out there ensuring your public safety by inspecting the bridges. Um, I, I give a similar presentation every year back at my alma mater, West Virginia University, um, and that's one reason I have a, bridge, a picture of a bridge from West Virginia. <laughs> but I, I, give, I give a presentation to someone during sophomores, so part of this presentation is from, from that presentation, but I... I try to, I give them this quote, which is my quote, um, to let them know that, hey, civil engineering is a great, um, great discipline to be in, to be studying, because as our society continues to grow in population, we're going to have more and more challenges from an infrastructure point of view. Um, so I think, you know, these challenges provide opportunities for civil engineers uh, currently and into the future, and in engineering in general. Uh, but I do want to give a quote from somebody that's a lot more famous than I am. Uh, if anybody, you may not remember this gentleman, but uh, his name was John Sununu. He was former White House Chief of Staff for President H.W. Bush. And just a little background on Mr. Sununu, Dr. Sununu. Had his, got his bachelor's, he was born in Cuba, got his bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. in mechanical engineering from MIT, <coughs> one of the best engineering schools in the country. Um, I, I think to get in the Mensa Society, you have to be in the 98th percentile of IQ. He was in the Mega Society, which is in the 99.9th percentile of IQ. But uh, there was, he was being interviewed one time uh, on a talk show or something, and the interviewer, interviewer asked Dr. Sununu, you know, what is your background? You know, most a lot of politicians have a background as lawyers, so he said, was your background as a lawyer? And Dr. Sununu replied, no, sir, I'm an engineer. I solve problems. So my little, my little dig at lawyers, sir. Uh, 
some of the speaking points, I'll give you a little bit of my background, um, my education, my work experience. But more interestingly, I want to kind of show you some photos from the construction of a pretty significant bridge I was fortunate enough to work on very early in my career. I was only a year and a half out of school. Um, it might be the biggest, probably will be the biggest bridge I ever had the opportunity to work on. So I'll give you some uh, what I think are interesting construction photos uh, through the sequential construction and I'll kind of explain some of the design challenges we face. Um, also want to let you know what the qualities of a success, successful engineer are so that, you know, hopefully you can start instilling these skills and qualities in your students uh, while they're in middle school and high school. I want to also give you an idea of what some of the employment opportunities would be for a civil engineer so that if you're asked by your students you can say hey th these are something these are some of the things you can do or some of the employers you could work for in the future. Uh, and I think more importantly for tonight what you can do as educators to train the next generation of engineers. So a little bit about me, that's all my title, blah, blah, blah. I'm a bridge engineer by trade. Um, I, got, I joined uh, my current employer in February 2013. Uh, previous to that, I was almost 19 years with a company called Michael Baker Jr. Incorporated. My current company, um, I manage the Mechanicsburg office here locally. We're headquartered north of Baltimore. The uh, company I used to work for is headquartered west of Pittsburgh. And uh, I work both in the Pittsburgh office and in the Harrisburg office on North Front Street. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering uh, from West Virginia University uh, and graduated in 1994. I'm a registered professional engineer in PA, Maryland, and Virginia. So how do you become a registered professional engineer? Well, the first step is you have to take a, a test called Engineering and Training, uh, preferably while you're still in college. If you're a senior and junior or senior in college because that really tests you a broad base of all the engineering courses and math courses and science courses you've taken. <coughs> Even though I was in civil engineering, I had to answer, there's questions on the test regarding thermodynamics. So the engineering training really covers all types of engineering. Then you have to have a minimum of four years of experience under a registered professional engineer. You have to be trained by uh, a PE. And then you would be eligible to take the professional engineering course, which is an all-day course. But that, that course is then specialized into your area of expertise. So the course I took was geared towards civil engineers. And then if you pass that test, then you become a professional engineer, um, which a little bit seems unfair because I've worked with some great engineers who were, weren't very good test takers. And you know, they kind of freeze up during the test. They had, they had trouble t t passing the test. Um, but, you know, it's, it's what we deal with in our society to be licensed and uh, to, to be able to stamp uh, construction drawings, uh, we have to have a professional engineer's license in my, my field. And then most states will then give you reciprocity. Uh, if you pass the test in one state, you usually get, like, you can apply for reciprocity in other states. So I didn't have to take three different tests, thankfully. Took one test, sent an application, sent me, sent them some money, and they gave me a uh, license in that state as well. <coughs> so uh, before we get started to the example project, you know, civil engineers design, build, and maintain infrastructure. So what is infrastructure? Well, it's many different things. It's things that we probably take for granted uh, every day, but we use every day. Okay, so we have roads, highways, and interstates. This is how we get to and from work and whatever things we do in our daily life, the places we go to. This is where I work in, in this industry. Uh, of course, airports, ports, and harbors. We don't live really that close to a coast. You know, we're a few hours away from the coast, but you know, uh, there is quite a bit of commercial shipping traffic throughout the world, um, so ports and harbors are very important. Uh, buildings, bridges, tunnels, and other structures. Um, of course, you know, we're standing in a building that was designed by an engineer, by an architect at some point. Uh, waterways and dams, and it's, uh, whether you believe in uh, climate change and global warming, I think we're, at least in my lifetime, seeing more significant storm events, flooding events, etc. So um, being able to uh, manage our, our waterways and, you know, predict flooding and hopefully pre prevent catastrophic failure of life and property is becoming more and more important. 
Also, some things we might take for granted, like indoor plumbing, right? Water, sewer, and other utilities. And, uh, you know, so those are some of the things civil engineers are involved in. So the example project I want to go over, is, uh, we call it the Maysville Bridge, and I'll, it's since been renamed after it opened to traffic, so we'll talk about that. The client was the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. So this bridge spanned the Ohio River from Ohio, from Aberdeen, Ohio, to Maysville, Kentucky. And when you have a bridge that crosses a river from one state to another, generally speaking, each state will have an agreement where, okay, you lead, Kentucky, you lead this bridge, and then the next bridge downstream or upstream will lead is, is Ohio. Okay, so typically, uh, well, Kentucky led this bridge, but Ohio was involved in reviewing and approving the design. The, cons the prime consultant was American Consulting Engineers. My, the company I worked for at the time was Michael Baker. They were a subconsultant to American. And the contractor who built the bridge was Trailer Brothers Incorporated. The bridge was <coughs> open to traffic in the summer of 2000 with an approximate construction cost of $37 million. In today's dollars, uh, because of the inflation of construction, which is greatly outpaced, uh, the general inflation rate, this bridge will be well over $100 million, uh, today if we build a similar bridge. The bridge carries uh, U.S. Route 6268 of the Ohio River, as I mentioned, between Maysville, Kentucky, and Aberdeen, Ohio. And the bridge type is a steel cable stay bridge with main river spans totaling 2,100 feet. <coughs> so just to give you an idea, not the greatest map, but um, here is Cincinnati, Ohio. So the Ohio River actually runs upstream this way. And here's Maysville, Kentucky. Here's Huntington, West Virginia. So the river follows this path, and the bridge was right there. It's about an hour upstream, which actually is this direction from Cincinnati. Here's an aerial view of the bridge taken in the summer of 2000 following completion of the bridge. Uh, and this, as you can see, is a cable stay bridge. So we have the, the, the span from this river bank to this river bank, which 2,100 feet. The main span from tower to tower was 1,000. 150 feet. So I'm sure you guys drive over bridges all the time, drive under bridges, and most of the time you probably see what we call a uh, slab on beam bridge. So we have beams and we have a concrete deck on top, and we might have a number of piers that go across the creek or across the river. Okay. For example, let's talk about the Market Street Bridge in Harrisburg. It has a lot of piers across the river in short spans. Okay. So why would this bridge requires such a long span. Why couldn't we put a number of piers across the river here? Depth of the water? Depth of the water? Well, that might be one of the reasons. It could be a cost prohibitive to build piers in the water, but. Or just passage? Right, navigational traffic. So the United States Army Corps of Engineers <coughs> regulates commercial shipping traffic on our rivers. And their requirement, we had to have a certain navigational clearance both laterally and vertically. So we had to span that navigational clearance. So when you get to a span of that length, we're now talking uh, specialized bridge types. Okay, It's not your everyday slab on beam bridges. And so the cable stay bridge was, was obviously selected, but other bridges were evaluated, other bridge types. Um, suspension bridge was evaluated, uh, steel truss bridge was evaluated, uh, and those evaluations included you know, uh, design costs, construction costs, what span could we, could we get, how, how heavy was the bridge, and how much could the uh, underlying soil or rock support from a weight standpoint. So those are some of the things that went into the evaluation. But at the end of the day, the Cable State Bridge was determined to be the best solution for this site at that particular time. Again, economics may change over time and change this decision if we were to design this bridge and constructed today, maybe it will be a different bridge type depending on economics. So let's go through some of the construction. Well, but we'll first we'll go talk a little bit about the analysis. So this is a pretty complex bridge. So even back in 1994 and 95, we did have computer programs. Of course, in 20 some years since then, the computer programs have gotten more robust and uh, more specialized and easier to use. But the program that our um, analysis used at the time was, was called ANSYS. And, you know, so you can see here what would be a finite element model of the bridge, and you can see that not only do we have 
the cables, the towers, and the superstructure, beams and deck that you saw in the photo. We also have modeled the foundation that is actually underground, constructed underground that you don't see in the photos. But and this bridge was unique in the fact that we have we had to consider time dependent effects. Okay, what do I mean by that? In simpler bridges, when we have a beam on slab bridge, we assume that the dead load is placed all at one time, and therefore that's the only condition we need to account for from a dead load perspective. Obviously, we have vehicles that drive over the bridge, and we have weights of those vehicles that we need to analyze, but we don't take into account any variations in time of the dead load because typically they're very small for a simple bridge. But some of the things we're going to take into account here, okay, you think normally concrete, you think, okay, you pour concrete, it hardens, it doesn't change. Well, actually, concrete does change over time. Uh, it actually uh, undergoes shrinkage, where it continues to lose uh, water over time through evaporation. Okay, and as the concrete loses water, it shrinks in volume. And, you know, it's very slow, but it does occur over time. Concrete also uh, tends to creep. And what is creep? Creep is a continual deflection under a, the same sustained load. So, for example, if I put a 2 by 4 from one table to the other, and I put a 25 pound weight on it, we're going to have an initial deflection of that 2 by 4 But if that, if, if, uh, if that was a concrete beam, over time, that deflection would slowly increase even though we have not in increased the weight. So that's called creep. It's a, it's a slow amount of increased deflection over time. And then the third thing we need to take into account with this bridge was the relaxation of the steel cables. So the steel cables are tensioned to a certain load at the beginning <coughs> of construction, but over time the steel tends to relax slightly and that load is decreased. So we would have to take into account what we call 1,000 day loads. We have, would have to analyze what those loads were and make sure the bridge components met the load demands for that time, that, that point in time of 1,000 days. And we also would um, analyze 10,000 day loads. So that at that point, the creep has increased, the shrinkage has increased, and the relaxation in the strands has increased. And we would have to envelope our design to cover both time situations, 1,000 day and 10,000 day. Uh, so, we're starting to go through some of the sequential construction here, and one of the concrete towers is being constructed, you can see the other one in the foreground, or the background, which is actually uh, advanced a little bit more in construction. But what the contractor was doing, which we haven't seen the slides previous to this, they call a coffer dam, where they, they will drive steel sheeting down into the riverbed, connect that into a big rectangular box, make it watertight, then pump out the water. So now you have a, uh, a dry area inside the box, or theoretically dry, it's a little bit tough to keep it completely dry. And then they will, um, in this case, we had what we call drilled shafts, which are filled with concrete caissons. So large diameter concrete caissons that go under the riverbed, and they have a, a concrete cap. And then from there, we build up the uh, base of the tower, and then start up the tower leg. So, this, this is a sequence of construction for the towers. Uh, here at this point we see that the towers are complete and now we're starting to erect the steel superstructure. And then my job, again, a year and a half out of college, so a little bit of a daunting task, for, is I, I was in charge of designing the steel edge girders. Okay? And you can see here that we have some, uh, some brackets attached to the girder. What do you think they're for? The cables are going to attach, where, that's where the cables are going to attach to the girders eventually, okay? So, again, because we have to, because of shipping requirements, okay, the steel is fabricated at some off-site plant, and it's going to be shipped or barged, depending on the situation, to the site. So we're limited by the length of the members that we can deliver. So those members then have to be spliced together on the bridge as we build it. So that's what's going on here. This is being lifted into place and going to be spliced this section. So you can see that this section will be twisted and put in line with the section behind. So the members that go transverse, these are the girders, 
Here we transversely, we call those floor beams. Okay, so now we're starting to see the, that the super steel superstructure is coming together a little bit further along. Um, you can see we have the steel edge girders here. You can see the floor beams. To give you an idea of the size of the girders, you can see one of the construction workers here attaching one of the girder splices. So what occurs is these steel members are butted up together, and then they have splice plates that are put on the outside and, and bolted together. So both pieces are bolted together via splice plates. Again, you can also see the cable connection here that the cables are not attached to yet. Um, again, so we have the transfer floor beams. We have these longitudinal stringers as well, and I'll explain why those are needed on the bridge uh, shortly. <coughs> Okay, so here we have temporary vents that support the superstructure because, of course, we don't have the cables yet. Um, so the cables will be attached eventually, but at this point they're not. So we need the uh, temporary steel vents to hold up the superstructure. Uh, here's an aerial view, and the, this particular bridge was at the end spans was built from the riverbank forward. And then they used what they call cantilever construction that we'll, we'll see shortly. Um, well, actually, I guess we're not going to see it, but basically they start from a tower and they go out um, the same amount and then they put the cables on as they go out. So they kind of balances the load over the tower. That's how they build the, the, the middle span. So they build the back span and then they start building it towards the middle span. So now we see the bridge deck has been placed. Now on this particular bridge, normally on typical bridges, we'll place the beams and then the concrete deck is poured. So they'll have stay-in-place forms that will hold the wet concrete, and there'll be rebar that are on top of the stay-in-place forms. You pour the deck, it cures for about a month, and then you can run traffic on it after that. To speed construction on this bridge, we actually designed precast deck panels, rectangular, and installed them on the bridge. So can you see this color concrete here longitudinally? and then transversely. So the concrete, the precast panels are rectangular. You see one here, you see one here. And then those were then joined post tension together. Cables would run through the adjoining uh, sections. They would be stressed to push them together. And then we would, they would pour concrete in the joints in between, called closure pours. So in this particular case, we use precast concrete. Now what do you think, what do you see here, the screen? These green things, what are, what, what are they? Ocean requirement. <laughs> Ocean requirement, well, okay. So you don't fall off. Yeah, well, what do you need on the bridge so your car doesn't fall off into the river? Oh, are those metal? Yeah, so that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the steel rebar for a concrete barrier on the bridge. So at this point, the concrete barrier hasn't been poured yet. So the, the, this is the rebar, and it's green because it's epoxy coated. So the epoxy coating helps prevent future corrosion. So at this point, the, uh, the, the, barrier, the deck's been placed and the closure pours have been made, but the barrier has not been poured yet. Okay, here's the cantilever construction I was telling you about. So we're actually a little bit out of sequence here, but um, so you, before we saw pictures of them building the end span from the riverbank in using temporary vents. Now that we're out to the tower, they start going towards the middle and attaching cables as they go. So that balances the load on the tower um, so it doesn't get too much load one direction or the other so that it would sway one direction or the other. So we get out here to the middle of the river. You can see now both sides are coming together and now we need a barge mounted crane to start lifting the pieces in uh, to, fi to fix up the closure, the closure here. Now keep this in mind. You're coming from 1150 feet away towards the middle. Our bolt holes have a tolerance of about one-eighth of an inch, maybe a sixteenth of an inch tolerance, okay? If, you, if you've ever dealt with metal, it tends to expand and contract due to temperature quite a bit, especially with steel. So we designed theoretically for a temperature of 68 degrees. Um, and so we had to set the geometry of the bridge that, okay, this bridge should come together at 68 degrees. But what if it's not 68 degrees? Okay? So you might have a problem where this middle piece is too short or too long, 
And if you're trying to line up bolt holes with only an eighth of an inch clearance, it's a little bit of a tight operation, okay? So you hopefully have good weather. Secondly, think of this, okay? What is holding up this, these girders right here? Basically the cables, right? Think of these cables as guitar strings that you have to tune, okay? How much load do we have to put in each of those cables to get those steel girders at the elevation we need them? Okay, so that was another part of the analysis that we used the computer model for, was to try to get the geometry to work up, work together, so that we had the right amount of uh, force in those cables, so that the geometry would come together in the middle of the bridge. So again, here's the completed bridge um, in its final condition. And after it opened, it was dedicated um, as the William A. Charsha Bridge. Um, I'm not exactly sure who William A. Charsha was, but it's, he was certainly famous enough to have a bridge uh, named after him. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah, so I, I, at least in my mind, it's a beautiful bridge. Uh, it serves its purpose across the Ohio River. Uh, and actually, in uh, 2001, the bridge won, the design won a national award, uh, which, you know, the, the team I was part of was, was part of the winning team. Yes, ma'am? How long did it take from whatever point to being finished? Uh, design or construction? Construction. Construction. I think it was a little over a year for construction. You know, obviously during the winter months there are certain things you can't do. But that's another reason to use the precast panels because, number one, when you, do, when you have something fabricated in a plant, you usually get uh, higher quality uh, materials. Um, you can also get higher strength. But another reason is they could continue to construct the bridge by placing the, the slabs, and it wasn't as weather dependent as you would be if you had a cast in place concrete. And the design part? Design was uh, all said and done because there's a lot of other, instead of just the bridge design, you have the environmental issues you have to contend with and, and all the, the uh, permits and so forth. But probably three to four years for the total design from start to finish. Yes, sir. Was there a pre-existing bridge you had to demo? Um, I, that's a good question. I don't think there was a pre-existing bridge they, right here. Did your company also build the roads? Yes, yeah, so yeah, well, they, yeah, the company, well, the prime consultant designed the roads coming up to it, yeah. I don't, there might have been a previous bridge here, I'm not sure. You guys I, didn't demo that? No, they had, that was a separate contract, yeah, so we, we were not involved in that. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. The caissons that you put in for the uh, main towers. Yes. Were did you were they hammered in or were they dug and poured? No, no. The, the, so the way that um, the drill caissons is they have a, a, a huge drill bit. So what they do is they drive steel casing. So you have a big circular steel casing. And I don't know. I can't remember what the diameter if it was four or five feet. But they drive the casing down well, they to have bedrock. Them. Okay. okay? And then they will drill out the material out of the steel casing. And then they, they put a big rebar case. You have a lot of vertical rebar that's then connected with circular hoops around it. So they'll drop the cage down into each hole. And then they usually have to tremie pour concrete, which tremie pour means there's going to be water in the hole. But as you put concrete in, it's going to push the water back up out the top. So that's they tremie poured the concrete in. Yeah. Yes. Can you explain what's the difference between this cable stayed type of bridge and a suspension bridge? Okay, so, so a suspension bridge basically still has two towers, but the cable runs from one end all the way to the other. So it'll, it'll be anchored into the river bank some, <coughs> at the ends, but then it'll run over top the first tower, down, over top the next tower, all the way to the other river bank. So they're anchored in. So it's all one cable where these had a number of individual cables uh, connected to the tower, which the cable state gives you a little bit more redundancy. So we also designed for the situation if one of the cables broke, that the other cables could pick up the force and you would not have a problem with the bridge. So, sir, so yeah. Golden Gate Bridge is a suspension bridge? Golden Gate Bridge is a su suspension bridge, yes. Yes, sir. You mentioned the cable stretch and the fact that over time that, that, that uh, tensile does change the amount of tension on that. Right. Is that continuous? I, I'm sure it would slow down, but is that still going to that happens? Right. Yeah, the mo it does occur, you know, it's kind of a curve where you have most of the relaxation very early in the bridge and then it tends to slow down. So I think there was actually provisions to, to come back in and rejack those cables. 
Um, so, you know, but, you know, you're right, over time, it, the, the amount of relaxation slows down to where it can be ignored at that point. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what happened in the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis that, that collapsed? Uh, good point, good question. <laughs> uh, my company was a little bit involved in that. And, uh, so those of you that may not remember, it's ooh, probably been seven or eight years ago, when the I-35 W bridge in Minneapolis uh, collapsed. Um, that was a truss bridge, okay? And they were actually working on the bridge, doing a rehabilitation project to the bridge. So what occurred there is what they found out was the gusset plates, which a gusset plate is a big plate that connects all the truss members coming in at a panel point. So again, in that older, old of a bridge, it was probably riveted construction. Uh, it wasn't bolted, you know, bolted construction didn't come into probably the 60s or 70s. So it was riveted construction. But what they found out was that that gusset plate was actually designed incorrectly originally. Now, there wasn't enough load on the bridge over you know, we, we design for the worst case scenario typically. So everyday traffic, you may never get the worst case scenario. But what happened during construction is they stockpiled aggregate, you know, rock. They just had a pile of rock on the bridge that they were using the bridge as storage. Um, and given that load situation, that created a, that created a situation where that gusset plate um, fractured and therefore the truss members come apart. Now, it's a good question you bring up because I want to talk about load path redundancy or redundant bridges, okay? A, a truss bridge has two main load carrying members. So if one of those members fails, what's going to happen to the bridge? It, the one member cannot stay and hold the bridge up, so the whole bridge is going to collapse. That's what we call a fracture critical bridge, okay? So we try to avoid those bridges when we can, but, you know, when we have these long river spans, um, you know, back in, the, back in the day from the 30s all the way through the 60s and maybe 70s, truss bridges were fairly economical because um, they, they could give you long spans. And, you know, putting a third truss uh, would just be a lot more cost prohibitive. So, um, you know, I, I used to teach a bridge inspection course that focused on fracture critical steel bridges. And I used to start out that course of saying, you know, it's very interesting to me as an engineer that we put a man on the moon in 1969, but yet we did not understand or even know about the fatigue and fracture of metals. Because we didn't really start detecting these fracture problems and fatigue problems in bridges until the early 70s. And a lot of the research was done at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania to <clears throat> determine what was the cause of fatigue, how, what were some of the welded details that that caused problems over time. So, um, you know, those non-redundant bridges that we still have a lot of out there are inspected very frequently and also some of those we know now are fracture critical details are being retrofitted, retrofitted to try to prevent those I-35 type collapses from occurring. So, Thank you. Yes? Um, so we're going through climate change that a lot of your material can expand or contract depending on um, temperature. Mm -hmm. So when you guys calculate the uh, range that of the temperature, do you yes. guys use like previous data from temperature ranges or do you use uh, predicted? Do you, do you well, we have design codes we follow. So the design codes list the temperature range. To my knowledge, those temperature ranges haven't changed since I've been an engineer. Now, in the future, may they change? They probably will as more data is gathered. Um, but, uh, yeah, so they haven't changed since I've been designing bridges in the last 20 years. Yes, sir. You mentioned you had to, by code, the Army Corps of Engineers, right. the span between the towers, but the height of the deck from the water. What, what do you use to gauge that, like? Flood levels? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. How do we determine how high the bridge needs to be off the water? And we, we do what we call a hydrologic and hydraulic analysis. So um, they gather uh, data from over the years about how what the rain intensity is, and they, partic they pick a particular storm. And in this case, in this large of a river, it will be the 100-year design storm. So that that is the probability that that 
flood will occur once every 100 years. Now, here in the last 15, 20 years, we've had probably a number of 100-year events uh, in different states across the country. But so it's a, it's a, you know, a, a, a data point that we use for design. I guess that kind of like, yeah. So. Uh, are yes. those numbers changing now? The numbers, yeah, the, the, the temperature range for the materials have not changed, but the hydrology is changing, yes, and so are the hydraulics. So they're planning um, for that. Then. Yes, yeah, those, those are changing. Um, and so we, we basically do an analysis of the river and the flood levels and say, okay, you know, in a 100-year storm, this will be the flood level at this particular location. And therefore, we want to have our bridge be above that by maybe just barely, maybe two feet, whatever the criteria becomes. But yeah, so that's, and then another interesting thing is, is that in this type of bridge, we had also designed for a runaway barge impact. Okay, so what if a barge broke loose and was coming down river at a high speed and hit the pier? So it hit that tower. That's another scenario we had to design the bridge for as well. So, okay. So Natasha's telling me I need to move on, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions afterwards. We're almost done. So, um, so what advice can I give you as educators? And, and I want to give you some of what I think are the qualities of a successful engineer. Logical thinker. We'll come back to this because that is the, the main, one of the main things I think we're lacking in some of our students that are entering the industry is uh, problem solving and, and being able to think logically. Okay. Uh, teamwork. If, if the days of uh, little beady glasses and a pencil protector and you going to work in your corner as an engineer and never talking to anybody all day are over, you know, they've been, they've been long gone. So we always work as a team every day. And uh, I've spent the last week doing performance reviews for about eight different people. So, you know, you always have the personnel aspects of uh, teamwork. But creativity, you know, we, we need to have uh, new ideas. And, and think of new ways to do things better, cheaper, and faster. Uh, effective communicator. Uh, one of the greatest influences on my education was my high school math teacher. And, and it's, it's like anything else. At the time, you didn't really realize how much she was teaching. You didn't appreciate what she was teaching you. But I, all, all my classmates would say, why is she marking up my grammar, spelling, and punctuation on a math test. <laughs> you know, well, first of all, why is she asking me questions that I have to answer in writing to begin with in a math course? You know, but you know, there was, you know, she knew that we would have to have good communication skills. And uh, so writing, speaking, uh, being able to communicate verbally are very important skills ties back to teamwork. Flexibility and enthusiasm. So, you know, um, we were talking at our table this evening, you know, um, Paula said her son thought he wanted to go into mechanical engineering, took a tour of a mechanical engineering lab, walked down and said it's not for me. So you have to be enthusiastic and like what you want to do. It might take some people longer to figure that out than others, but, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for as well. So employment opportunities, I mean, there's a number of federal, state, local government agencies. Consulting, which is the area I work in, uh, construction from basically fabricating materials, erecting materials, managing the construction, academia, teaching and research, and also military service. A lot of people don't realize that our military has a lot of civil engineers, and um, it's a you know, great, great place to start your career. We have a number of folks that work for our company that are Navy veterans and started their career as civil engineers in the Navy. So some of the things I, I think you can do as educators, and, and us in industry, at least I am, willing to help you in this area as much as I can, is teach and foster problem solving, okay? And I know you all probably have pre-scripted curriculums that you have to stick with to meet whatever state test your students are going to take at the end of the year, et cetera. But if you have flexibility, try to, try to get them uh, thinking about problem solving. And I have a handout I'd like to give you. It's called the Popsicle Bridge. And I've printed out the first two pages from the internet site that you can get that to, to start fostering that problem solving. And, you know, we had a whole course as a freshman when I was in civil engineering at Western University. In fact, all engineers took it, which was just called problem solving. And we learned how to identify a problem, define it, come up with um, feasible 
solutions, evaluate those solutions, and at the end of the day, recommend what we thought the best solution was. So I think that we have a lot of students come out of school, what do you want me to do? Well, you have a problem. What did you evaluate it? What's your recommendation to me? You know, so I think we're lacking in problem solving. Effective verbal and written communication. I think Dr. Chorney kind of alluded to this in his presentation that we're lacking reading and writing skills, okay? Um, that's, that's an important part of our, of our business. Uh, teamwork, obviously you have to have the, the basis of math and science skills. I mean, that's the foundation of, of, uh, of engineering, so you have to have those skills. But also business acumen, um, because sometimes, well, most times, a lot of decisions come down to money, okay? And you have to be able to evaluate what is the most economical solution but also, as the further I get in my career, the less I'm an engineer and the more I am a business manager. And I have to worry about the financials. You know, I work for a company that uh, is a for-profit company, so they like to make money. <laughs> so, you know, I have to make sure that the work we do is profitable for our company. So, again, I, I, I have the handout for the Popsicle Bridge. Here's the website where you can get that. Um, you know, if you... Obviously, I, I have a full-time job, so I can't come to every single school that you all represent, but if you need me to come sometime and, and help you with an activity or, or speak to your students about a, a possible career in engineering, I, I'll try to do my best to accommodate your request. Um, I also have my business card here, and here's my contact information. So again, I'd like to say thank you. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be more than happy to take those, or I'm going to stay after for a while as well. Thank you.